Okay, last time we were talking about some very basic things about history of the Middle East. And of course, remember in this course, we're trying to cover a long period of history. We're not going to be able to do all of it equally, right? It's just too much. I have, in fact, in the past at other places, taught this over a whole year. You know, you could do like the first part and the second part. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll get a good overview in a semester. Uh, one of the things that we mentioned, I think, last time, we'll see if I can get this to work for me. Seems to be not quite cooperating. Let me see what I'm doing wrong. Not showing up on your screen. So let me try something else here. Oh, I see. Okay, here we are. Uh, we're talking about the Middle East. And we're going to take a look, of course, uh, from about, let's say, 600. We might even go back a little before and take it on up to today. So <clears throat> there are some things that we mentioned last time, remember, that <clears throat> today we don't normally think of the Middle East as being advanced in technology or culture. At one point they were. But they were, right. At one point they were... Uh, the most advanced. <clears throat> this is because, <clears throat> excuse me, they, um, they not only inherited, but they developed mathematical ideas, science, medicine, philosophy. They got a lot of the things that had been developed during the Greek period, Greek and Roman period, which in fact had been abandoned um, by some early Christians who basically thought some of this philosophy and some of these things were pagan. And um, they kicked out a lot of this, they shut down the school of philosophy in Athens, for example, uh, during the Byzantine period. Where, what happened to those people? Most of those people moved further east. They moved to places like Baghdad, Damascus, and so forth. Now, the other thing you have to remember is, is that the Islamic world was tied together, although it wasn't uh, for most of its period, it was not sort of like one giant country, but it was one culture that was tied together because remember, they have uh, a practice called the Hajj, a pilgrimage, where every Muslim, if at all possible, should um, go to Mecca at least once in their life. That meant that there was a lot of cultural exchange and blending during that period because it was about a month-long period. What's the word? Hajj. H-A-J-J, -J, usually. Hajj. Yeah. It just means pilgrimage or journey. We didn't go over the five pillars of Islam here, but we will, uh, and that's one of them. Anyway, that means then that a lot of the ideas can exchange. And it also sets up interesting things culturally in that these people are going to be traveling. Sometimes somebody might be a Muslim in Spain, and there were Muslims end up all the way over into, say, Pakistan. But they all will eventually come to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. So one of the things that having the Hajj does is it also uh, gets the, the Islamic world to set up banking, what we might call international banking. Because if you're traveling from Spain to Mecca, you don't really want to put thousands of dollars in your pocket. Let's use modern terminology put $5,000 in your pocket and just head out down the road, right? Something might happen to you. So 
they sort of set up a system whereby they could draw money from a bank, from, from an institution at Mecca that would have the money then transferred, not electronically as we do today, but physically would be transferred from Spain um, or from Pakistan or at Iraq or wherever they're coming from. All right, so that, that develops later too. But that means that there's a lot of exchange. So a lot of the things that we have in the West that we might not even think about, we're indebted to uh, the Islamic world. Philosophy. Some of the um, greatest philosophy, you know. And we think about somebody like, if, if you're in medieval studies, you might have heard of a guy named Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, a great theologian, Roman Catholic, right? He studies the philosophy of Aristotle, but really he's studying the philosophy of Aristotle indirectly through a lot of the helps that came from the Islamic world. Because they take the teachings of Aristotle and Plato and others, and they filter it through and they improve to it and add to it. A lot of that stuff makes its way back, say, to writings in Spain, those writings in Spain are in Arabic. And in fact, there are a lot of Jewish scholars in Spain who end up translating that into Latin. So now the writings of Aristotle, instead of coming directly from Greece to Europe, they've made their way all the way around through the Islamic world and through the Arabic language and through all the things that they've added to it. That's just one way. Medicine, the same way. They take the ancient Greek teachings about medicine, they add to them, they improve them, they write uh, medical manuals, I guess we would say, which were then translated. Astronomy. Most all the names of all the constellations, if you trace them back, you'll find most of the names have their derivation originally in the Islamic world, the Babylonian world. Geometry, algebra, even the word algebra is an Arabic word. The concept of zero, zero is an Arabic word, okay? Um, zero, the, the, it, the concept may have come originally from India, but it was propagated through the Islamic world. And uh, it, it is developed in the Islamic world, in algebra especially, in what will become calculus and so forth. Because the Romans, think about it. You know Roman numerals? There is no zero. There's not even an indication of a zero in Roman numerals. They start with one. There are no negative numbers. There are no numbers in between numbers. <laughs> there is no zero. You have whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five, with Roman numerals. Um, okay, so you get the idea? There's a lot of stuff there we don't have time to go over at all. Also things like coffee and sugar, which I know many of you are addicted to both. You can thank or blame the Islamic world. Coffee comes from the southern part of Arabia, originally. They then cultivated in eastern Africa, right across from Arabia, okay? And then from there, it's been transported around the world to wherever the climate can be used to grow it. In places like Central America, South America, other parts of Africa. It has to be a warm climate. But it also needs to be a, uh, you know, a climate that doesn't freeze, but it also needs to be a climate that doesn't get too hot. So that means it's mostly in mountainous or high, you know, hilly areas, like Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia, Brazil, in this part of the world. Over Christmas, I visited a coffee plantation, I guess they'd call it, coffee plantation. They were growing, I was out there in the fields with all the coffee, and the coffee was ready to pick. It gets red. The little, they call them beans, they're technically not beans, but you pick those. So I picked a few, right? Have a few at my house that are now, they're now black. So I assume they're in this country illegally. So no one report me. 
Wait a minute, this is recorded. No, I was just kidding. Okay. So, uh, but yes, coffee and sugar. Sugar, again, originated as a plant in India, but is propagated and spread around by the Arabs, and they begin to grow it in Palestine, down by the Jordan River, and other parts of the world. Now, that is the cultural debt that we have to the Islamic world, but most of that takes place prior to around 14 or 1500 A.D. Things begin to turn during that time, from 1400 to 1900 A.D., things begin to have more, um, more growth in Europe with the coming of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the discovery, we'll put in quotes, of the New World, the Reformation, sure. The Reformation will uh, begin to motivate people economically. There's a lot of things. There are a lot of things that happen in Europe during that, say, four or five hundred year period that put them ahead. Plus, what I didn't even mention, the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution is going to put Europe way ahead of the Middle East. And still, in most regards, we are today. The countries in the Middle East that are doing the best, although they've hit on a little harder times, are the ones with oil. But they're pretty much a single commodity market. So they've made a lot of money. They're still making it, don't get me wrong, they're still making a lot of money, but they're not making as much money as they used to because now uh, the, the high price that we had a few years ago has led people to do some creative ways to get oil, natural gas, other petroleums, in other ways. The only non-oil country that's doing better than all the other ones is Israel. Well, I suppose Israel has no oil, Jordan has no oil, Egypt has very little oil, Syria does not have much oil, Turkey doesn't have much oil, so really most of the oil is around the Gulf, Iraq, in the southern part of Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, you know, so forth. Those are the areas that have most of the oil. But even there, uh, they, they have, you know, it was just growing exponentially. Now it's kind of leveled off because the price of oil has dropped. Anyway, but still, uh, technology-wise, cultural-wise, the West, I mean, we'll take a look at it. Most people around the world speak English. They don't speak Arabic. And if they want to learn a language, they want to learn English. If they speak another language, you want to learn English first. Here's our next question. And maybe we got to this last time. Not, uh, uh, it's, it's that of definitions. What is the Middle East? The Middle East, is, you know, if I asked a lot of people, what's the Middle East? A lot of people would tell me the Middle East is where the Muslims live. Right? Some, some people would tell me that. Where the Muslims are. It's Muslims or Muslim countries. Okay. Um, yes, the Middle East has a large majority of Muslims living there, no doubt about it. However, um, just where Muslims live does not equal the Middle East. Okay? The Middle East has a high percentage of Muslims living there in those countries, but they by no means have all the Muslims. In fact, uh, not all Arabs are Muslims, and not all Muslims are Arabs. So that's a good thing, way to remember it. Okay? There are a lot of Arabs who are Christian. Um, there are Arabs who are Zoroastrian still today. Yazidi is another religion that's been persecuted, which is not Christian. Sometimes I've heard it reported in the media as being Christians. But they had Christians surrounded on a mountain, and they were being attacked by the ISIS, um, and then I'm thinking, Christians on a mountain. Then they said Yazidis. Well, Yazidis are not Christian. They're not Muslim, and they were attacked, no doubt about it. And so there has been a lot of persecution, especially recently it's been intensified, and so a lot of Christians have fled or are fleeing the Middle East, certain countries like Iraq especially, 
Uh, North Africa. North Africa we could include. Some people include it in the Middle East. In this country, we, or this country, this class will tend to include it, although we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about North Africa. We will talk about Egypt. Um, maybe sometime on Tunisia, Morocco, that's what we're talking about here, Algeria. Uh, the main reason this gets included is that it doesn't really fit, you know, you got the Sahara that kind of divides Africa, and it doesn't fit sub-Saharan Africa, and it fits a lot more in with, say, Egypt and the Middle East. So people tend to group North Africa, and it's also predominantly Muslim. But the people there, there are some Arabs there, but the native population are Berbers, they're called, Berbers. B-E-R, B-E-R, which are not Arabs, okay? What about the middle, historic Middle East? Yes, definitely would include that. Palestine, Syria, Arabia, what today we would call Jordan and Israel, Lebanon, Syria, right? Iraq, those are all in the Middle East. Iran would be uh, normally included in the Middle East, but definitely not Arab. Okay, and then the Gulf states, which I just mentioned, places like Abu Dhabi, you know, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Yemen, Oman, okay. Saudi Arabia. These are normally included. Bahrain, these are all included in the Middle East typically. Now, most of my experience has been in Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. So most of my examples will be from there. Persia is normally included even though they're not Arab. They speak a different language. They are different people. They speak Farsi. They sometimes call themselves Persians instead of Iranians. Iraq certainly is included. Turkey. Turkey is another sort of outlier. And even within Turkey, they sometimes debate. I mean, typically most people put Turkey in with the Middle East. But sometimes the Turks have tried to separate themselves from the Middle East. And they've tried to align themselves with Europe. They have tried to join the European economic community, for example. They are... I don't know, associates or candidates in that, whether that's ever going to happen or not, is doubtful, you know, because the whole future of the European economic community is up in the air right now. We've got a lot of troubles. And the problem with Turkey was, of course, their human rights record, things like that. And by the way, Turks are definitely not Arabs. And Turks and Arabs do not get along. I guess maybe the fact that most of the Middle East was controlled by Turks for many years who many people in that part of the world felt the Ottomans were cruel or certainly uh, gave them a hard time. So they're, they're not eager to be lumped together on either side. So if you go to Turkey and call those people Arabic or Arabs, they do not get happy. I remember one time when I was in Turkey, I took a group of students there we were eating lunch at a famous little fast place to eat not far from the Hagia Sophia and we're in the line and um, one of the words they say in Turkish is merhaba merhaba right and in Arabic they say marhaba and it means hello in both and so when the guy said merhaba I said, yeah, so that's very similar to the, the Arabic word marhaba. No, that did not go over. What do you mean, Arabic? It is not Arabic. It's Turkish, you know. And he was very, very upset. So I tried to leave quickly. Anyway, so don't make that mistake. Merhaba and marhaba, um, very similar, but very different in some people's minds. Now, what about the climate in the Middle East? It can vary. There's a lot of variation in the Middle East. But you can find some pretty extreme climates. For example, if you go to Iraq, 
Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Oman, and so forth, and you're there in the summertime, it can get very, very hot. 130 degrees is not unusual, okay? 130 degrees Fahrenheit, especially in the Gulf. In fact, people from the Gulf would come to places like Jordan, at least they used to, uh, in the summertime to get away from the heat, where it was only 100 degrees. Because I was in Jordan, and I remember seeing these, these big, beautiful tents put up and stuff. I asked somebody, what is that? Well, those bunch of rich guys from Kuwait. They came in and they rented out an entire hotel. Just rented the whole hotel. We'll take the whole thing. Kind of took over the kitchen, took over all the rooms. Of course, they wanted more space, so they brought a really fancy tent that was also air-conditioned, and they put it outside of the hotel, and they were all from Kuwait, because, you know, they have billionaires, they have millions and millions of dollars. It's no big deal. They were there in you know, July, June and July. It was, it was 90 to 100 degrees every day, but they came there because it was cool. Well, if you're used to 130, 120, it's kind of like when I moved here to Florida, right? Like, you, know, you guys go around, like, even on a day like today, I saw people wearing coats and flannel shirts, long sleeves, and uh, some people wearing hats, gloves. Why? Because it's only going to get up to 62 degrees or 65 degrees today or whatever it's going to be. Um, yeah, it seems crazy to me because I'm not used to Now, uh, imagine, um, you know, coming from a place that's much colder to a place that's much warmer, everything seems warmer to me. But if you come from a place that's very hot, like say here, it's going to be 100, 110. You go to a place that's 90 or 85, no, that's nothing. It's nothing. I've noticed that in Florida, there's kind of a crisis any time the temperature outside your house is less than the temperature inside your house. It's a winter weather emergency. Whereas for me, I would rather the temperature outside my house be a little cooler than what's inside the house so that when I go outside, I'm, but I live in Florida, so that doesn't happen very often. Take advantage of it when it does. Now, much of the region is dry. Uh, arid, desert, and I don't know what you think of when you think of desert. You probably imagine some movies or films or whatever you've seen with just giant piles of sand dunes that go on for miles and being wind blown. That is the way deserts sometimes look, but to be a desert doesn't mean you've got to have big piles of sand blown around. It just means how much rain you get per year. So sometimes deserts are quite rocky, for example, rugged with uh, angular rocks, um, and sometimes some scruffy vegetation, right? Uh, cactus, by the way, were brought to the Middle East by the British who brought them from other parts of the world. They're not native to the Middle East. So. As a matter of fact, the British took cactus or cacti all around the world, anywhere they went. Um, uh, they did it because it would grow. They did it because you can cut it open and get some moisture. They did it because, for example, there is a cactus called the prickly pear. You can actually eat it. You have to eat it very carefully. It has very long needles on it. So you have to break it off. In fact, the way you can do it is, you know, in modern times, you take an aluminum can, you kind of cut it open, put the aluminum can, like a Pepsi can or something over it, grab it that way and break it off. And once you get it on the ground, you kind of roll it on the ground to try to get some of the needles off of it. And you very carefully try to cut off the outer layer to get to the inside part that's, that's fleshy. How's that? Fleshy, fruity. And it actually tastes good. Some people make it into, now, even here, like say in the Southwest, make it into jelly, prickly pear jelly, stuff like that. Natural resources. Oil, of course, we, when I asked you last time, what did you think of? Many of you mentioned oil. You thought of oil, you thought of terrorism. Oil is a very recent 
development in the Middle East, the dependency, if we want to call it that, the necessity of oil is also very recent. It's only been about 100 years that anybody had much use for oil in large scales. And that definitely corresponds with automobiles. And in 1919, there weren't many automobiles. Okay, 1918. Uh, automobiles began towards the end of the 19th century, really not going to mass production until the 20th century. And that's when the need for gasoline, and that then develops the need for oil and refining oil. Oil is then discovered in different parts of the Middle East, but most of it uh, not until after World War II, to be quite honest. Uh, so the development that you see in, um, say, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, all that has happened in the last, say, 70 years since World War II. And, like I mentioned earlier, whenever I mentioned it earlier, uh, this part of the world typically only has one resource. Saudi Arabia really only has oil. Abu Dhabi and Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, and so forth, the only thing they got going for them is oil. Right now, that's good. But as different kinds of energy, energy sources are developed, or as perhaps that oil is depleted, although they got a lot of it, um, they, they are desperately trying to diversify their economy. But they don't have resources. So what they've done in a place like the United Arab Emirates is they've tried to make themselves into an international banking and finance center. Okay, so they're trying to attract that. They're trying to attract uh, universities and education. They're trying to attract, you know, try, trying to bring about desalinization, which is very expensive to take seawater, take the salt out of it so you can drink it or use it for irrigation. They're, they're doing it, it can be done, but it's very expensive. So they don't have water as a resource. They don't really have agriculture as a resource. They don't have gold, they don't have silver, they don't have coal, they don't have, what do they have? They have oil, that's it. So this creates a problem for them. The lack of water, I would say, um, is the root of a lot of, of a lot of the conflict in the Middle East. That if I said there had to be one thing that most people probably don't guess that is one of the major factors, I don't hear people talking about it, is water and the lack there of water. A lot of things that drives what's going on is to get to water. If you don't have water, you're not going to live. Nothing will grow and you will die. Matter of fact, you're gonna die quicker without water than you will without food by a long shot. So you gotta have water. And a lot of the conflict that comes, and I think increasingly as time goes on across the world, water is going to create more conflict eventually than oil or, or anything else. Not quite there yet, but it's coming. See, in California, what's the biggest problem in California? Water. Yeah. It's the biggest, one of the biggest problems in Africa? Water. It's one of the biggest problems in the Middle East. It's having water that you can drink and just having any water at all you can irrigate with. Where are you going to get the water? Okay? So that is a big, big problem. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention while we have time, and we still have a few minutes, is in the Middle East, a lot of times people sort of have a homogeneous impression of the Middle East. In other words, it's all the same. It looks the same, it, no, the people are the same, everything's the same. So I think if I just said Middle East, in a lot of people's minds, they'd see a lot of sand, they'd see a camel maybe, they'd see an oil, Derek, you know, oil pumping or refinery or something. They'd see a guy in a kafia, uh, maybe, maybe a rich guy driving a some kind of fancy Mercedes or something, and uh, terrorists with uh, with a vest, you know, suicide uh, stuff on him. Um, 
And a lot of that impression, what I'm trying to say is a lot of our impression of what you think of the Middle East is what you watch in movies, television shows, um, what's portrayed on the news. But in fact, the Middle East is quite diverse in many ways. For example, it's diverse in religion. Yes, the majority religion across the Middle East is Islam, no doubt about it. But there's a lot of other religions there. It's not monolithically everyone's a Muslim. For example, that like I said, there's a there's a good percentage of Jews or Jews and Christians, and even a, even other smaller religions. I'm not going to list them all. Like Druze in Israel, there's Druze. There there's Yazidis. There are Zoroastrians. There, and even within Islam, which we haven't talked about this yet, Islam is not a monotheistic or no. no it is monotheistic. It's not a monocultural thing. There are there are, are Shias, there are Sunnis, there are Sufis, and several other smaller groups of Muslims. So it is diverse in its religion. It's definitely diverse in its ethnic groups. Certainly Arabs are the largest, I suppose, population in the Middle East. But you have a large number of Persians, which would be Iranians, <coughs> Kurds, <coughs> if you've been following at all what's been happening in Iraq, Turkey, Syria, the Kurds live in all those areas, and the Kurds would like to have their own country called Kurdistan, probably, or something along that lines. They don't have it, and they're divided up between other countries, and so they create trouble in all of those countries. They want to be independent. Um, we don't have Turks down. Turks would be uh, another group in the Middle East, big group in the Middle East. I don't have listed Turks. And there's many others. The geography is diverse. We think of desert and dry and so forth, but there are a lot of agriculture in Egypt, in Palestine, in Syria. There's a lot of wheat that's grown. Uh, there's a lot of fruit, you know, there's a lot of fig trees and date palms and on and on it goes. Pomegranates that grow. So yes, mostly it's dry, drier than certainly Florida, but it uh, doesn't mean things don't, don't grow. Resources are diverse. What I tried to mention at the beginning of the hour is that a lot of the countries in the Middle East do not have oil. They don't have any oil. Like a place like Jordan has no oil at all. Lebanon, no oil at all. Turkey, I think, has very little. It's these, you know, but the, the assumption is somebody in the Middle East, they got a lot of oil. Not true. Water. Some have more water than others. There's a lot of dispute over water. And the level of water that people have is also diverse. Wealth. The other, the very common perception in the Middle East prior to 9-11 is that everybody in the Middle East was very rich. They were wealthy oil sheikhs and they had all kinds of money and yachts and so forth. Uh, there is a lot of poverty in the Middle East. A lot of poverty in Egypt, even in Saudi Arabia. Um, Syria, Jordan, a lot of people have very, very little money, very little resources. They're very poor. So we have a lot of stereotypes in the Middle East. Prior to 9-11, it was this. Sheikhs wearing kafiyas and long robes with a harem who's very wealthy, with fancy cars and yachts, and is very rich because of oil. Or what's been the common thing for the past 15, 16 years or more, at least 20 years probably, has been the terrorist. Everybody in the Middle East is a terrorist. They all hate the West. They all want to kill everybody in the West, and so forth. Neither one of these stereotypes is true. I'll just leave it at that. Globalization of culture. What happens is, and this is something that we, we do need to remember, is that the Western uh, culture is so pervasive that it invades the Middle East with music videos, films, the internet, all the stuff that you know is on the internet, they can get that in the Middle East. 
So their idea is about the West is that the West is very corrupt and that that is corrupting their country, corrupting their youth. This, is, this fuels part of the animosity with the West. I think we're out of time. So don't forget that on Wednesday,